Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's fantastic to be part of the very first um, Brighton TEDx um, event. Um, what I thought I'd do to start off my talk is actually put a few numbers up and see whether those numbers mean anything um, to anyone. So the first number is 553, and the second number is 586. No takers? If I put the word days on there, does that mean anything to anybody? Excellent. We have got people that have realised that there are 553 days to the London 2012 Olympics and 586 days to the Paralympics. And although there's been lots of controversy of whether um, the Olympics should come to London, is it good for Britain to have um, the Olympics, I think it's a reason to be cheerful um, in, in line with the um, topic of today. And particularly so if you look at Beijing and how well um, Team GB did. We did extremely well in the medals table, um, and therefore lots of optimism as far as I'm concerned um, for London 2012, that actually we may um, top um, at least some of the medals tables in different types of sports um, that we enter into. And if you're from a different country, I hope you do um, as well um, yourselves. Um, but that leads me on to the question really of, of the talk, uh, talk today, um, and that is, what makes a high-performance athlete? What is it about them that is different to the other athletes and everybody else um, that's around there? So what's the comparison to the, to the also-ran person? Perhaps that doesn't quite achieve the top of their game, or perhaps you and I would perhaps enter into sporting activities at different times, but we're never going to reach um, those very, very high um, top levels. So what I've got for you, first of all, is just a few ideas that I have in terms of what's making this high-performance athlete. And I'm just going to focus in on a few of those. So the first one is, is training and technique. These athletes undergo tremendous training um, regimes. They really perfect the technique for that individual sport and spend many hours um, making sure they're really ready for the top of their game. Technology comes into play, whether it's the training, as we're seeing in that picture um, there, or whether is it a new running shoe? Is it the development of a new javelin? Is it the differences and changes you see um, to the bicycle um, that they're going, to be run, uh, uh, they're going to be riding? Is it the hard work that's involved, getting up at that 4.30 in the morning on that cold, wet day, and you're not really wanting to do it at all, but you know you absolutely have to to make sure that training um, really is in place? Is it the often forgotten about care and support team um, that's around them? All, virtually all of these athletes would say, without the support of my coach, my family, my friends and others, I wouldn't be able to ever get um, to that top point. And I think all of these very much are true. But there's a big missing gap down the bottom, as far as I'm concerned, and that's the anatomy and the physiology. How does the anatomy and the physiology change in these developing athletes to enable those to be really at the top of their game? Is it something that is going to change as they make the cha uh, those training um, um, times and put all that effort in? Well, when we look at bodies of athletes, they always look really good, but are they absolutely designed for that specific sport? Is it different? When you look at different types of sport um, um, and different types of athletes, are they truly different? So, a number of us at Brighton Sussex Medical School and um, the Chelsea School at University of Brighton um, got together, and um, that's Gordon um, and Malcolm and then Gary, um, and we got together to start to think about, well, how can we have a little look at this? So the first thing we needed was we needed a population um, to look at. And we were very, very lucky um, um, to get a number of athletes um, to come on board with us. We have um, Sophie right at the top there. We have Todd and Ollie. These are three triathletes. We have Halil here, who's a weightlifter. And these are champions already in their own rights, but very much geared towards um, um, getting into London 2012. We're also very proud to have Darren Kenny, um, who is a Paralympian himself, he's a cyclist, and he won four golds and one silver medal at Beijing. So he really is absolutely at the top of his game. So we've got the project team in place, we've got the athletes ready. What are we actually going to do with them? Well, we're going to scan them. We're going to scan them in our MRI scanner up at the University of Sussex campus um, and look at different regions of their bodies. So we actually scan all of our athletes and then focus in on particular areas where we say, yeah, they use that region for that particular sport. Therefore, has the anatomy adapted in some way? Is it specialised in some way um, for what they're actually going to be doing? So for those of you who don't know what MRI actually means, it means magnetic resonance imaging. And basically that means is this um, bit of technology has a very massive, powerful magnet within it 
that really aligns all of the atoms in your body. That's then interpreted by a computer, and then you get an image out of it. So effectively what it's doing, and we have Ollie, one of our triathletes there, and basically you can go through artificial segments all the way through the body, different planes, all in different views, and then take a unique inside look at how that body um, actually is at that precise time. So in other words, um, we're doing it um, when a living um, person. So if we just focus in on um, Ollie's lower leg there, blow it up um, in the picture there, just to show you what will essentially happen. So we can take a plane of section um, through the limb like that. It's um, essentially then removing that part of the tissue and then looking in from that direction that you're seeing there. And then we can then create an image of exactly what we're seeing. And obviously in that picture there, we're seeing the knee joint. If you then blow that up, MRI is fantastic for looking at various different soft tissues, particularly um, within that area. So we can denote, based on the colorings of all those grays, whites, and blacks, exactly what we're looking at, and therefore can analyze any changes that might be under, uh, undertaken um, because of a certain sport. So that, that line there, we can see a fat layer because it's a nice white, sort of very light gray, and a slightly darker gray there for the muscle. Ligaments and tendons are showing you there in the more black color. So lots of differences that we can see, and therefore we have um, some that we can um, analyze and actually start to see whether there's any differences between the athletes that we're looking at. But therefore we need comparisons. And the first comparison we need to think about is the athletes themselves, and we can do that. So Halil as a weightlifter, um, Todd as a triathlete, what differences might there between, be between those? And there's Todd um, there. What we also want to see about Todd, we can't really go back in time and say, what were you like? before you started. That would be a much longer um, study time and we aren't able to do that. So we have to come up with the normal um, in inverted commas. And so we looked around the team. Who was going to volunteer to be the normal? Everyone holding themselves in. No, I don't think I'm that normal um, really. So Malcolm, um, our consultant radiologist, decided yeah, he'd go for it. I haven't given him a gold medal. I've given him a gold star, though, uh, for being top of the team to, to volunteer. So in addition to scanning all of our athletes, we scanned um, a Malcolm um, as well. Or he scanned himself because he's the head of the unit um, anyway. Um, so then we're able to make comparisons. So obviously, time is short this morning, so I just thought I'd focus in on one particular region of the body. And that's the back. And we're looking at um, Todd's back in that picture there. The back is a completely underestimated region of your bodies. You're using it all the time in all the different functions that you do. Me standing here, if you sit upright, if you do any sort of sport, if you're lifting, shopping, you are using your back. And in fact, we lose about five to six million working days a year in the UK because of back problems. So it's a really important region. And that's just showing if you remove all the skin, we've got various layers of muscles under there doing different jobs. And we can see some superficial muscles getting deeper, right down to the core there. And those are muscles that are right up against your vertebral column. And as I said, they're very, very important for doing um, the various jobs um, that we need to do. So in these particular little animations, anything in green means the muscle is contracting or getting shorter, i.e. it's at work at that point. So as that skeleton flexes forward and then extends its back again, that means those muscles are tremendously important for bringing you up into that erect um, position. Likewise, if I bend from one side to the other, and we can see that again in this picture here, you're using different sets of muscles to enable you to be able to do that. So the muscles are absolutely key to knowing whether we've got um, and the right sort of movements and this, um, whether we're going to see any differences in our athletes. So as well as I said of, of comparing to the norm, we want to see where there's any differences. And here we have Ollie doing a long distance swim as part of his triathlon, and we have Halil there going to be lifting weights. Two very, very different sports. This is an endurance event. This is an explosive non-endurance event. You just need a very um, a, a enormous amount of, of effort at one peak time. So what's the difference that we can see um, and with those? So here we are, here's a scan of Malcolm's back. This is our normal um, sample that we're seeing here. And I'm not sure how good the contrast is from your direction. Effectively, it would be like taking the plane of section, coming through the body um, like that, and then looking from that back um, region. And this is the main back muscles here. These are the erector muscles that are enabling Malcolm to stand upright, down into the gluteal muscles in the back side um, um, there. And we can see that by the various colors that we're looking at. This rather large area on the side here, is fat tissue. 
which doesn't please Malcolm at all. He thought he was quite a thin chap um, by that. This is the bit where all men try and lie and say, oh, it's my external oblique showing um, um, there. It's truly not. These are the love handles. Um, it doesn't disguise any of those sorts of thi things. So we can see that um, particular scan. If we then take a section through this direction here and look from below, we see a slightly different view. So now this would be at the front of the body, i.e. just here, and this would be at the back just here. And then we're now looking through um, the body. So things to note here is, again, that large area of fat all the way around. Um, sorry, Malcolm. Um, <laughs> he'll kill me now. Um, but look at these muscles here. These are the um, big erector muscles. These are these ones that we're looking at here. Quite large muscles, quite robust, we would think. But look how much pattern they are with marbling of connective tissues and fat within them. That means they're doing a job, but they're probably not as good um, as they could be, but absolutely fine for what Malcolm does. But let's then compare that with Halil, who is our weightlifter. What differences are we going to see? Well, in his back, the first thing to say is the muscle is extensive in terms of it going really quite a long way across the body. It's very much sculpted. You can see a defined shape to it. Um, the gluteal muscles are also extremely well um, developed. Surprisingly, though, look at the layer of fat that's still there. So you'd say this is an athlete at the top of their game, but they've got a layer of fat. That's there. What this is demonstrating to you is you need the power of those muscles to do the explosive activity, but it actually doesn't mean anything. There's no consequence to having some fat around that. It's not stopping that activity um, 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 taking place. And so if we then do the same section through Halil and look, don't worry about the sort of contrast sort of differences, but look down here, we can see those areas of, of fat in place, but also look at these muscles. Hardly any real connective tissues um, and fat layers visible within them. They're the real fillet steak now of the back. Um, so they're the pure muscle and pure for power, for what is absolutely needed um, for Halil to do that. And so when you look at his back, you can see all of those muscles absolutely at work, enabling him to lift the bar. But more importantly, if you look from this side view um, version, we can see here that the back is absolutely important in making sure he can maintain his posture as he's bringing those weights up. But more importantly, also, the gluteal muscles are going to enable him to really lift through and take that bar above his, his head, as well as obviously the arms and the legs being very important. So perfectly designed for what he needs to be able to um, do. So how different is that when we then look at um, our triathletes? And the triathletes, therefore, um, um, are doing different types of sports. So there's Malcolm's scan again. Now let's put Ollie's scan up. Ollie's one of our triathletes. And again, don't worry about the color, slight color differences. Look at some of the other differences. Look how massive these um, back muscles are and how much they extend across the length of the back. Also, look at these other muscles um, that are around here as well, the rectus abdominis muscles at the front, what everyone wants, the six pack um, that is there, and the oblique muscles sitting at the side. But look at the fat level. Hardly any at all there, and when you move up to this area here, absolutely nothing at that front region um, there. So in terms of importance for um, um, Ollie, he doesn't want to drag any excess um, weight around with him um, at all. So it's very, very important. But so what other muscles is he using? So this is just showing you the um, rectus abdominis muscle at the front there. He's using that muscle much more. So when he does something like a dive into a pool, he's using all of these muscles that are around to create the shape that he needs to be able to maintain that shape. And then because it's an endurance event and he's going to have to keep on going, those muscles have to be terribly lean. He doesn't want to drag any other weight with him. So his anatomy is quite different. And when you look at this picture here, you can certainly see some of those other muscles at work. So this is, I flipped the image around here to show you, they're the back muscles which we can see here. These are the abdominal muscles here which you can't quite see, but look at these oblique muscles here. These are these ones here. So they're really at function at this level and you can really see them because there's no fat layer around them. So therefore, when we look at the two different backs, they're perfectly designed for what they want to do, but they're quite different. So when we look at Todd's back here, you can see beautifully developed muscles within the back. Um, and they're what we'd call sort of a cut muscle because there's very little fat over them, perfectly designed for what they do. Look at Halil's back, look how dramatically different the bulk is for those particular muscles because you need the power associated with them. And the MRI imaging has really shown us how that has actually um, changed because you're able to look completely through. 
So that's fine for normal athletes, but how about, how about someone that's perhaps been in an accident or a trauma? So here we have Darren. Darren um, Kenny was involved in a serious um, cycle accident when he was 18, um, and it meant he couldn't really use the side, one side of his body very well. And therefore, for us, that was really quite exciting to be able to look at and say, OK, what's happened to the anatomy there? Because we're obviously going to see some differences um, within Darren. So he came back to cycling and got, obviously, to the top level of his game. You look at the difference between these two, though, I can't tell the difference. You might be able to time tiny little differences, but I don't really think, could you tell me which side of his body um, and was um, involved in the accident more or, or injured more, or from these ones down here? It shows the massive amount of adaptation anatomy can do. So it can really, really start preparing and changing itself to the demands that we're going to place on it. So I would hope that that means that you've got from uh, the message this morning is that our bodies really can develop to, the, to this ultimate goal, um, to the anatomy adapting itself to get really to that top um, um, level. And therefore, I think I'm pretty optimistic that maybe they won't all get medals, but they'll certainly be able to achieve right at the top of their game. But what does that mean for you and I? We might partake in, in sport, and we just heard from the last speaker um, that we enjoy it when we're, we're doing some sport. So it might be um, different types of sport you do. You might have had too many mince pies at Christmas, and therefore deciding I must join a fitness club and get a little bit of rid of this weight. That may be um, the case for everyone, but there certainly is a reason to be cheerful in 2011. As one um, company um, in, in the States puts it, if you've got a body, you're a potential athlete. What I would say to you is, you might not want to be at the top of these games, but whatever you're going to do, your anatomy is going to be up for that challenge. Thank you very much.